so confession time. I did not plan this out at all when I started this series. I was just like, hey, I'm going to talk about cancer all through April. Daffodil Month, and it's also my, just this weekend, I hit my four-year anniversary of finishing chemo, so yay! Uh, but no, I did not plan anything out in terms of, like, how many videos this was going to take, or what I should talk about in each one. So, it's basically a lot of times, like, I sit down to plan out a video, and I'm just like, hey, where did I leave off last time? So the result is I did have this like mental debate with myself as to whether or not this part should be its own video or get smushed in with the next one. But in the end, it was like the next the next one's gonna be I think again I don't plan these out very well, but I think that the next one's gonna be when I actually have my big surgery. So that's kind of gonna be its own thing. And it's kind of a long, complicated thing. So I figured let's just do this and get all some random information in there before we get to there. So, this is, this video I'm talking about the time in between basically the whole three, of this entire like three and a half month period, and I'm going to try and sum up into that 10-15 minutes, all the way between uh, when I went and I got my second opinion kind of done. Actually, no, not even. Even a little bit before that. But all the way up until going to actually get my tumor removed. So, this was kind of not a fun period of my life, obviously, but really in a different way than the other periods of this whole, of my whole cancer experience was because this was the time when I had no clue what was going to happen. I just knew it's going to be bad. Which, yeah, really sucks. So I was getting passed around to a lot of different doctors, um, all taking a look at me. Eventually, I went out to Edmonton uh, with my mom and my aunt. Uh, we came, we went out over, I think it was like the end of Christmas break, so like late December, early January, uh, and the doctor who was there, who I actually, I, you know, I, I've been trying to not mention the names of medical professionals that I meet on this channel, but, or, or with this series, but I think that I actually will, uh, use this one, um, the fantastic Dr. Meta at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. This guy is like, okay, I was told before I went in to go and meet with Dr. Meta that like this is the guy that the, the neurosurgeon in Regina said, this is the guy that I call when I have a problem. This is the guy when people all over the country and in the United, and even in the United States, they call him when they have a problem. He's like the best, I guess, as that was what everyone was telling me. And, you know, like, not like I can go around comparing neurosurgeons, because, well, to be fair, I, I am a little bit more qualified than most people. I mean, I've had two operate on me. The first one, by the way, in Saskatoon was also very good. Uh, just he wasn't available to do my full surgery. But, um, yeah, Dr. Meta was definitely fantastic. Um, I was in a situation about a year and a half ago where I did have a friend of a friend, um, one of my uh, teachers at school had a, a close friend who had a, a child who also had a brain tumor and this was one of, this was what this was the name that I gave her was this Dr. Meta in Edmonton. So I don't know if anybody else has brain surgery needs pediatric brain surgery. There we go. Anyway, so when I went out to go and meet this guy, it was so different than any of my other doctor experiences. One thing that I've talked about, you know, or it keeps popping up, is the fact that, you know, I had, I got diagnosed when I was 14, which is a really weird age to have a medical crisis, because 
you're technically still pediatrics, but you're not a kid anymore. And it's not even like that. Oh, I'm not a kid right now. I'm a teenager. I can be treated like a grown up. No, like pediatrics, they wire it for little kids as they should, because kids have different needs going through a medical situation when you're a little kid is like even scarier than it is for adults. So, you know, all the rooms have cartoon characters on them, which actually I don't mind because, you know, I love cartoon characters. Talk about them all the time. But anyways, they give you like stuffed animals at all your appointments and like, yes, it's sweet, but you know, at a certain point, you know, you do want someone to actually talk to you like you're an adult. And Dr. Mehta was the first doctor who really was able to do do that. When he was talking, when we were in those appointments, he was talking to me, not my parents. And he was honest with me. Like, you know, in my last video, I talked about the really bad news that I got from a certain doctor. He was saying, like, yes, that is a possible outcome, but it's a very unlikely one. He was very honest that, like, these are the things that could happen to you. These are the things that could go wrong. These are all possibilities. But they're not likely. And they're, and he was telling me the things that he thought that we could do to make sure that these things didn't happen to me. So it was really a lot of confidence that got inspired in me during that first meeting. Up until we got to one bit of information, which had somehow eluded me this whole time, which is the thing that I actually have done a video about before, but I'm talking about it again because it's important. My brain tumor uh, was situated right over a part of my brain that controls my left hand. You know, I'm sure you've all heard this before, you know, your right side of the brain controls your left side of your body and vice versa. So my brain tumor was on the right side of my head, right over the part that controls my left hand. So taking that tumor out, I mean, brain surgery is brain damage. Simply put, that's what it is. It Yes, it is for to help you, and in my case, it was to get something even more damaging out, but it is still brain damage. And any time you have anything happen to your brain, it's a big issue. That's why there's such a big deal that, that gets made about concussions, because it's still a brain injury. And sometimes even something like a concussion that you get when you're playing a sport, it could end up causing a lifelong repercussions not always not usually even for like minor brain injuries but for larger brain injuries like what i had yeah so i just i remember sitting there and not knowing what to say for a bit and then finally managing those words that i'm a piano player I will be honest, I didn't want to go through with the surgery just because of that. And maybe it sounds stupid because, like, yeah, I, like, this is literally a life-saving procedure. But they basically told me, like, you know, my left hand was going to be completely immobile. So I was trying to figure out, like, hey, can I get away with, you know, just doing radiation and chemo or <sighs> what? Um, can I, is there, like, a smaller operation you can do? And really there wasn't any other options. And honestly, to this uh, if I'm being completely honest, maybe this sounds stupid. I know I, sh I know this sounds unbelievably stupid because, again, we are talking about a life-saving procedure here. But sometimes I'm not 100% sure that I should have gone through with that operation. Because even now, um, you know, like, I'm in music school, and I do, you know, pretty pretty fine with everything except 
uh, actual aspect of playing, which is something that it's like I can try as hard as I want, and 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 I can do everything right, I guess, but I'm still never going to be as good as somebody else. And it's almost gotten to the point a few times for me where it's like I'm I'm doing, I do fine in school, I do fine in my music classes, but like I'm still at risk of having to leave the program because I cannot play piano as well as I should be able to. And that's hard. I don't know. Like, maybe it's not just, like, maybe, like, I tell myself a lot of times I shouldn't be blaming this on my hand. Maybe it's just that, you know, I'm not a performer person, and maybe I've just gone as far as I can go, but I can't help but wonder all the time, like, if, if I if I could use both of my hands to their full ability, how good of a piano player could I be? Like I don't I don't want to brag. I'm not a performer. I'm in school to become a teacher. I was never planning on going into professional performance or anything like that. But I've worked hard, and I do think that I'm a pretty good piano player. But I just, I really wonder a lot of times if I could be even better if I hadn't had that surgery. And the answer is no, because I probably, because what would have happened is that that tumor probably would have kept growing and spreading and it would have messed up my hand anyways, which is so, like, and that that's if I'm not dead, which is also a possibility. So it was something that, honestly, I feel like that more than anything else in my life, and that includes like, like when when I when I moved out when I was 16, and when I said that we should take my mom off life support, and geez, I'm making my life sound really sad. It's really not, I swear. Like, like just I've had some rough stuff happen, but like I'm fine with it really, but. Uh, anyway, that more than anything else is that moment where I just had this unstoppable feeling of, like, there is no other option. Like, this absolutely sucks, but it's something that you have to do. It's like, I don't know, like, cleaning, cleaning a really messy bathroom or something. Like, this absolutely sucks, and you do not want to do it. But if you just leave it there, it's just going to get to be a bigger mess, and it's just going to end up getting worse and worse and worse. So literally your only option is one that completely sucks. So, yeah, I Honestly, I don't even think that I even got the chance to go and say that, you know, okay, I'll go ahead with the surgery. You know, my parents made the call for me, which, anyways, like I said, probably a better because I'm not sure if I would have had the guts to make that call. I was stuck seeing a lot of counselors in the weeks leading up to that operation. I also had the job of, I had to finally face the music and tell some of my friends that I had cancer, which was hard, but also kind of good, because like I said before, I was going into grade nine, I had no friends, and so it was kind of like, you know, I got, to, like all these new people that I was meeting, I got to kind of put a test on them, like, hey, if you can still, like, stick by me through this, we're good, we're gonna be best friends forever, or whatever, so, I did, and I ended up, I had, uh, seven people that I personally told that I had cancer before my operation, everybody else found out, you know, like, 
like my parents of course alerted the school and the teachers would you know alert each other not that it was a gossip thing it was like the counselor would inform the teachers that I had the rest of the teachers I don't know maybe some of them heard it through gossip but honestly it was mostly just that main group and then you know there were some other people you know like family friends or whatever but those guys all found out through members of my family or through or there were like other kids at school who found it out through the rumor mill in terms of people that i actually got to tell them like face to face it was seven and that group of people you know they're not 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 all of them actually i'll be completely honest but a lot of them are still my really good friends to this day so I think I'd all maybe just end it there because I'll I'll save the surgery thing for its own video because yeah they they literally cut my head open so I feel like that needs its own video to talk about anyways I'll see you guys later.